Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Ajay Solke, presently working as Assistant Professor, University School of Management, Kurukshetra University, Kurukshetra, Haryana. In this module, we are going to discuss the divergent perspectives of the role of government, types of government interventions, the means of state intervention, liberalization and the changing role of government, problems concerning the role of the government in industrial relations and what is the future role of the government. Upon completion of this module, a student should be able to understand the importance of the government in maintaining the fabric of industrial relations setup, the divergent perspectives of state interventions in IR, the ways and means of state intervention in IR, problems concerning the role of the government in industrial relations, future of state's intervention in maintaining the soundness of the industrial relations system. The role of the state in industrial relations is determined by its political, ideological and socio-economic orientation. This has a direct impact on the model it adopts for economic development. Divergent Perspectives The role of the government can be of the three typologies, one ideological, second political, third socio-economic. In ideological, it is further divided into four, socialist, communist, capitalist, neo capitalist persuasion. In political, the government can take adopt the role of neo colonial, democratic, dictatorship or military regime. In socio economic category, they can adopt the role of being a protectionist or a neoliberal. They can have export oriented policies. The role of the state varies depending upon the early, middle or late state of the development and industrialization and secondly on the level that is the international, national, industry, enterprise or shop floor of interactions. Types of government intervention. Types of intervention by the state in industrial relations. The very first type of intervention is where the government establishes and protect workers right. In the, in the lieu of the same they can give the right to associate and organize, right to bargain collectively, right to engage in industrial action. In this type of intervention, government can protect to the vulnerable sections by providing the specific guarantees and policies like minimum working age, where the children under 15 may not be employed, the minimum age for work is 18 years if the work is hazardous to health, safety or morals. Secondly, they can assure the equality of wages and employment opportunities. Thirdly, they can ensure the special provisions for the women category. For example, women workers need to be provided with maternity leave and they may not be compelled to work during the night. In this type of intervention, government establishes minimum compensation clauses for work. In this, they ensure minimum wages to the various sections of the society. They also ensure minimum non-wage benefits and overtime pay to the various sections of the society. Secondly, they assure a decent working conditions to the employees. In this, they specifically guarantee by providing a policy on minimum occupational health and safety and by ensuring maximum hours of work. For example, workers cannot ordinarily be required to work more than a certain number of hours in a week. They must have at least one rest day a week. Slide 14. In this type of intervention, government ensures and make provisions for income security. In this, they ensure the guarantees like social security, job security, severance pay and public works. The means of state intervention. The following are some of the major means of state intervention in industrial relations. Policies, legislations, institutions. Institutions we have for the three categories, facilitative, executive and judicial. The very first is policies. The policy framework in the sphere of labor and labor management relations can be varied depending upon the country's stage and level of development. Three broad trends in state intervention in industrial relations can be found in developing countries. The logic of peace and cooperation during the period of planned economic development and import substitution oriented industrialization. The logic of competition as economies are liberalized to integrate them with the global economy. Here cost cutting and value addition are very important. The focus is on the markets, not labor and efficiency, not so much on equity. The logic of competition as the dogmatic pursuit of competition brings to the foray 
growing unemployment and glaring inequity. Here the focus is on both efficiency and equity. Legislation. Laws include hard laws and soft laws. The international labor standards provide the basis for national laws concerning various aspects of employment and industrial relations. These are hard laws, codes of conduct, framework agreements, etc. comprise voluntary agreements. The legal framework usually provides the bare minimum standards. Progressive and professional managements, they should seek to do more than what the laws minimally entail. The legal framework needs to be reviewed from time to time to align laws with emerging requirements and to ensure their simplification and rationalization. The legal framework in the sphere of labor and labor management relations, they should balance the requirements of both labor and product markets and combine the need for efficiency with considerations of equity. It should uphold the principles envisaged in international labor standards. Third is institutions. The institutions dealing with industrial relations could be classified into facilitative, executive and judicial. In facilitative, the facilitative institutions can be of several kinds. They include, for instance, institutional mechanisms for the provision of skills, institutions for developing and operationalizing for a proactive labor market policies will include a national employment service that does not merely register job seekers, it play a mechanical role, but one that identifies the gap between required and acquired skills. It provides opportunities for bridging the gap and matching job seekers with job providers. In terms of minimum wage setting, it could include tripartite institutions for setting up and enforcing minimum wages. In terms of workplace democracy, it could include statutory and voluntary institutional mechanisms for worker involvement, representation, say and stake. In terms of grievance redressal, it could include systems and procedures for grievance redressal, handling of discipline and dispute settlement. Now comes the executive. The laws enacted by the state comes into effect only upon gadget notification for the purpose. The executive is also responsible for enforcing the laws through the labor administrative machinery appointed by the central and the state governments. The executive role can be visualized as a source of authority or service. If it is perceived as a service function, its effectiveness can be judged in terms of knowledge, accessibility and attitude of the incumbents. Are they knowledgeable? Are they accessible? Are they helpful? Here comes the judicial. The authorities described in the Industrial Dispute Act to interpret and adjudicate disputes are a part of the judicial machinery. The key question here is whether or not these institutions are specialized, independent and autonomous. Judicial independence and autonomy of the kind envisaged by the first and the second national commissions on labor will adversely impinge upon the discretionary power of the state. Discretionary power can be subjective and susceptible to abuse. Liberalization and the changing role of the government. In the wake of structural changes in the region, as elsewhere, dominant shifts in macroeconomic policies are discernible. First, from a centrally planned to a decentralized market economy, from liberalization and export oriented policies. Third, relative stagnation in employment in the organized sector, expansion in the informal sector, and growth in unemployment and poverty, privatization or private sector as an engine of growth, emphasis on productivity and profitability in economic and industrial enterprises in the state sector, increase in the incidence of industrial sickness, decline in job and income security, growth of a typical non-standard employment and adverse effects on employment opportunity for women. These shifts call for a reassessment of the role of the state in social and labor matters. In many countries, these developments have further strained the relations between governments and social partners, particularly on issues such as privatization and the increasing incidence of redundancies and a typical form of employment. It will require the redeployment of labor from unviable sectors. 
to expanding sectors and coping with sharp transitory drops in the demand for labor nationwide. Here some of the observations which reflects the nature and consequences of the changing role of the state in IR over a period of time. Observation number 1. Is the state really withdrawing from a more active role in the management of industrial relations either or both in the public and the private sectors? Observation number 2. What has been the state's role in the promotion of export oriented policies as compared to the earlier orientation towards import substitution in the countries of the region? Observation number 3. Have labor market and industrial relations reforms kept pace with the changes in macroeconomic liberalization policies in the countries of the region? Observation number 4. What governance arrangements link the changed role of the state to sound industrial relations in the countries of the region? Observation number 5. Has there been a marked tendency towards decentralization in collective bargaining? Observation number 6. What changes have occurred in the incidence of strikes and in conflict resolution mechanisms? Observation number 7. What evidence is there, if any, to suggest that there is a shift in emphasis from a conflict resolution to conflict avoidance and from dispute handling to preventive maintenance in industrial relations? Observation number 8. What are the new roles, if any, of the state in industrial relations, including in the areas of skill training, vocational, workforce adjustments and the national institutional framework of industrial relations? Observation number 9. What has the state done to promote sound labor relations? Observation number 10. What has the state done to initiate policy reform? Now, all these observations are specifically being answered into the module number 1. Problems concerning the role of the government in industrial relations. Persons who are appointed to the post of a labor minister, labor secretary and labor commissioner, they are expected to have an in-depth understanding of the historical, social and economic dimensions of the subject, apart from having the elementary empathy and sensitivity so essential for handling labor issues. In actual practice, this does not happen. The ministry at the central level and the departments at the state level, therefore, fail to make their presence felt and create the desired impact. Trade unions, they have political and ideological affiliations. If the labor minister at either central or state has his or her roots in any of the trade unions, his or her decision cannot have the necessary degree of objectivity or impartiality. He or she is sure to be influenced to whatever degree by the ideological beliefs of his or her past. Industrial Relation Commissions, as envisaged by the First National Commission on Labor 1966-69, would have provided an answer to the imbroglio of the biased ideologies of ministers. However, this was unacceptable to most of the states, as it would have resulted in the erosion of the authority of the labor minister concerned. One year comprises of 52 weeks and 365 days. If we have over 30 tripartite committees at the central level and an equal number of committees at the state level, we may be paying lip service to tripartism. However, we will be unable to do any justice to their actual functioning. This calls for a complete reorganization of the number, scope and mandate of these committees and their actual functioning. The central and the state governments have done precious little to ensure that industrial tribunals, labor codes are set up according to the need, that is, related to the number of cases, disputes that are on an average taken up for conciliation and adjudication. Persons of caliber and professional competence handle tribunals and courts. Labor-oriented recurrent training and orientation are provided to these persons. The trend is arrested wherein some cases have lingered for 15 to 20 years with the tribunals and constitutional writ jurisdiction of the high courts were invoked to challenge the awards of the tribunal and to stall their implementation. The perverse trend of taking recourse to protracted litigation and non-implementation is arrested. There are different judgments of the apex court at different points of time on the definition of the appropriate government and the interpretation of various sections and subsections of the Industrial Dispute Act 1947 Contract Labor Act 1970, Minimum Wages Act 1938, etc., which have confounded the prevailing confusion. Future Role of the Government In future, 
the role of the state will increasingly come under scrutiny not only by social partners at the national level, but by pressure groups at regional and international level. In a civil society, the role of the state will come under heavy scrutiny by social institutions. As Adams rightly questions, in future, societies may not necessarily accept uncritically the proposition that the state always act in best possible interest. A good industrial relations system is one that harmonizes the economic growth with social justice. It ensures observance of labor standards, is change friendly and promotes a culture of non-interference by one party into the affairs of another. The search for alternative strategies for achieving both efficient development and improvement in worker welfare tends to stress support for a minimal number of basic labor standards, free trade unions, collective bargaining, workplace institutions, capable of internalizing enforcement of labor standards and government regulations, investment in training and education and support for open markets, free trade and mobility of capital and labor resources as suggested by Cochin 1996. There are four main requirements in the building of viable industrial relation systems in future as suggested by Towers in 1996. There is a need for a general commitment of the actors to pluralist values which would include the legitimizing of workers rights and the role of the trade unions and other representative bodies. Here industrial relation legislation must shift from the negative role of minimizing conflict towards the positive goals of promoting labor flexibility and productivity through democratic institutions in the workplace. This legislation should also extend to all employees and not just industrial workers, especially as newly industrializing countries move into economic maturity reflected in the growth of their service sectors. And this parallels the second requirement, the locus of a stable system needs to be moved downwards towards the workplace, implying a weakening of the role of the state. The fourth point, however, needs to be clearly understood. The weakening of the role must be in terms of a substantial reduction of discretionary controlling power of the state and not that of an enabler or facilitator. Friends, I hope you have understood the contents well. You can also refer to other quadrants of this module for testing your knowledge and having some more input on theme of the module. Happy learning.